Let's talk about that instead. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Nick Castell. I'm a reporter with WCPN and WVIZ IdeaStream. I'm pleased to be here to moderate our panel conversation about the year ahead in politics. If you came here expecting to hear from Betty Sutton, it is the politics of the moment that forced a change in the schedule. This week she announced she's joining Rich Cordray's ticket in the Democratic Party primary in the race for Ohio governor, though I have a hard time believing that was actually this week because so much has happened. And since Cordray spoke here last month, her appearance on behalf of the campaign was no longer appropriate or fair to the other campaigns. So instead, we're going to look ahead to 2018. We've got congressional races, a Senate race, elections in every statewide office, governor, auditor, attorney general, treasurer, secretary of state, and there are no incumbents in any of those races. And of course, this is all happening as we begin the second year of the Trump presidency as Republicans and Democrats try to either maintain or take a hold of power in Congress. So here to help us understand what's ahead, we've got a panel of political observers. Uh, in the middle is Cinder Miller Cole, an instructor at the University of Akron's Racy Bliss Institute of Applied Politics. She received her BA and master's from the University of Akron. Henry Gomez to my left covers the National Republican Party for BuzzFeed and for many years he covered politics for Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer, as you well know. And Karen Kassler is the State House Bureau Chief for, the, for Ohio Public Radio and Television and my colleague at IdeaStream. So thanks so much for being here. Um, Karen, I want to start with you. Looking at the governor's race this year, what issues do you think are really going to come up and, and characterize this race? Well, in previous years, I would have said the economy, because that's usually the issue that drives everything. I think this year, it's, it's got to be President Trump. I think his influence has already been felt. I mean, just this week, Jim Renacci leaving the governor's race and going into the U.S. Senate race, saying it was the White House and Donald Trump who asked him to do that. Uh, already the Democrats have been campaigning uh, on the presidency of Donald Trump. I mean, I think that, I think he is going to be a huge shadow over this campaign on both sides. I think you're going to see in the Republican primary, you've got two candidates in Mary Taylor and Mike DeWine who are going to be talking about Donald Trump. Mary Taylor's very closely aligned herself with Trump. Mike DeWine has been a little bit away from that. And then, like I said, the Democrats are definitely campaigning against Trump. What will be interesting to see is the role that the current governor, John Kasich, will play. I think the Democrats will be bringing him up. But whether he will be brought up on the Republican side remains to be seen, I think. I, I, they've been avoiding talking about him. Well, Cinder, I want to ask you about that, because uh, how much do you think these candidates so far have talked about Governor Kasich? Do you expect Republicans to talk about him very much at all? I, I don't, actually. I mean, his numbers are polling pretty consistently, both approval and disapproval, somewhere in the 40s. So, I mean, I don't know that it is to anybody's real advantage to be bringing him up or talking about their relationship or lack thereof with the current administration. I think... I, I, I mean, it depends. It depends. I could see uh, Mike DeWine bringing it up as it relates to Mary Taylor's relationship with the governor. I don't, I don't know. I mean, like, like Karen said, she's doing uh, a fine job of aligning herself with the president. So, you know, you can see where she's trying to cast her net right now. But Is that unusual? He's the two-term governor. He's currently occupying that office that they want to hold. Don't you think they would talk about his legacy and whether they want to continue it or change it? 
They've talked about his legacy specifically with Medicaid expansion and how they don't want to continue that. So that's very interesting right there. I think John Kasich is a lot more popular in polls and in the national media than he is among Republicans who are likely to turn out for the primary. And I, I think you're going to see more Republicans who are likely to turn out in the primary be voting on their thoughts about Donald Trump. I mean, there are a lot of Republicans in the state who are still angry at John Kasich for not supporting Donald Trump, for not supporting him, not coming to the convention last year, not uh, supporting him in the end, speaking out against him even to this day for the most part. These are likely Republican voters in the primary, and I think that's important to mention. Now, Henry, you have uh, covered uh, members of Congress who either do or don't want President Trump to campaign for them, depending on how Hillary Clinton did in their district last year, or in 2016, rather. How do you think it's going to play out in Ohio? Do you think Republicans will, will be embracing Trump? I think that we're seeing already that some of them are. Interesting that Mary Taylor is aligning herself with Donald Trump. John Kasich actually endorsed her well over a year ago. And now that there's only two candidates left in that Republican field, she's kind of running away from Kasich. She's speaking out about Medicaid expansion. She's made it pretty clear that that's not an endorsement she necessarily wants to brag about. Uh, but you're seeing Jim Renacci, who until this week was a candidate for governor, really align himself with Trump. You know, he would he had a tweet a couple weeks ago, at least it feels like a couple weeks ago, it could have been yesterday, um, <laughs> about how great time at the White House last night. We saw this great movie. I got to talk to the president in the Oval Office. Like it said, it's, it basically said, I got to hang out with President Trump last night three times in the tweet. And it was, you know, it was, it was you know, as subtle as a, as a brick to the head. And then <laughs> Renacy made his entry into the Senate race this week contingent on support from Donald Trump. And he did that because Renacy's whole brand for running for governor was, I hate, I hate D.C., I hate Washington, it's terrible, I'm miserable there, I want to come back to Ohio and fix things in Columbus. And then this, <laughs> then this, then this Senate race spot opens up because of Mandel dropping out. And Renacy, the reason Renacy pushed the White House to support him was because he needed that cover to then go and run for a job that's in D.C. And he appears to have gotten that from the White House. He had a meeting there earlier this week and the next day announced that he was running for Senate instead. So he's, you're going to see Renacy want Trump here for him, uh, especially during the primary. And you know, in the general election, maybe that helps him against Sherrod Brown. So I think you're going to see the Republicans run more toward Trump than toward Kasich. And the congressional districts, I don't know that Trump will be helpful in all of them, but they might not need him because most of the congressional districts in Ohio are drawn in a way that there's not going to be a lot of uh, room for the challenging party to, uh, to win. Karen, when you look at uh, the campaign that Rob Portman ran for Senate uh, just two years ago, it seemed like he wanted to talk about anything but Donald Trump when he was running for president. Um, now we've got a candidate in Jim Renacci who's running toward Trump. What do you think changed? Well, 2016, obviously. When Donald Trump took Ohio, that changed a lot. And there were two counties that were very important in that, and they are Trumbull County and Montgomery County. They flipped from Democrat to Republican from 2012 to 2016. And, and those were really important counties, especially that Youngstown area, turned out to be extremely important. So I, I think it is very interesting to, to, to watch Rob Portman now. He, he's, he's got a long time before he has to stand for re-election again. And so he, he's been doing some things that I think a lot of people have been wondering about. For instance, endorsing Josh Mandel very early in the race, even long before the primary. I mean, it was, what, last way last year, and now Mandel's out. So I, I think that Rob Portman's interesting to watch here. Well, Cindra, when you look at the, um, the electoral map in Ohio, uh, you had counties uh, like Trumbull County. Uh, I've got marked down here. Erie County was plus 12 for Obama in 2012, and it was plus 10 for Trump. Uh, meanwhile, you've got counties like Franklin and Hamilton County that were actually more pro-Hillary Clinton than they were for Obama in 2012. How do you see the Ohio electoral map changing, and do you think uh, Democrats and Republicans are trying to adapt how they campaign to that? You know, I, I mean, Ohio is known as a bellwether state for a reason. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if some of those counties do flip back based on the, the you know, the statewide results here that we're going to be seeing in November. But at the same time, I mean, if, if you look at the president's numbers and where he's polling among likely Republican primary voters, he's still polling very high. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess, I guess 
I guess my answer to that question really is I don't know. I think that, that a lot could happen between now and November. Um, well, and I, I want to add too Karen. that typically in off year elections, the state has been redder. I mean, right. more Republican voters have turned out in off-year elections. That's how we got the Republican tsunami, as some people called it, in 2010, when Republicans took all these offices. These are the Republicans who are now leaving these offices and going into other offices to run. So unless Democrats really mobilize their base and get their base out in this off-year election, this midterm election, it's, it's looking like it's going to be a good year for Democrats. But in Ohio, Republicans have been the ones who typically have turned out in these midterm election years. Well, Henry, let's turn our attention then to the Democrats. Next week, uh, it's it said that we're going to see Dennis Kucinich enter the governor's race. Uh, certainly, he's known as being, uh, you know, on the on the progressive side of things as a Democrat. But he's also done some unusual things for a Democrat in this climate. He was a Fox News contributor, and from that position, he often questioned and criticized the Russia investigation. Do you think those kind of issues are going to come up as he's trying to win Democrats in in 2018? Yeah, absolutely. I think they're going to come up. I think that. Kucinich is really, his entry into this race is going to be a problem for the rest of the party that wants to win in, in November. I don't think Dennis Kucinich at the outset is their strongest candidate heading toward November. I think that you're seeing with Betty Sutton joining up with Rich Cordray, with Nan Whaley dropping out of the race, and I believe supporting Rich Cordray, that that seems to be where a lot of the momentum is heading. But Kucinich has name recognition. He also is still very well known in Cleveland, which is the Lions, Northeast Ohio, the media market is the lion's share of the votes in Ohio. And it's going to be still a crowded primary of four or five candidates. So if you're Rich Cordray, you're probably going to spend a lot of money emphasizing those things you just mentioned, his, his tenure at Fox News, the fact that he praised uh, President Trump's inaugural address last year, the fact uh, of his relationship with Syria, uh, some of these other things that aren't exactly in the, in the base for Ohio Democrats. So I, I think that's going to come up in the primary. I think it has to if Cordray wants to win. I think he's going to have to spend a lot of money to, <clears throat> to campaign. I think Kucinich is going to be one of the strongest rivals. So do you see this as being maybe a contentious primary for Democrats? I think it's. I think it's. I think it's getting. It's going to get that way. I mean, it was funny because we, we were talking backstage about Cordray's tweets, which are kind of interesting. If you haven't been following Richard Cordray on Twitter, follow him because it's like you know Jack Handy's deep thoughts from Saturday Night Live meets <laughs> Cheech and Chong, and it's. Um, I, I mean, they're 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 interesting, and in a way, they're kind of this wholesome antidote to President Trump's tweets. Um, but they're also a little a little out there. But one of them was. Uh, I guess it looks like we have competition now. And it was like the day after Dennis Kucinich filed his uh, paperwork signifying he was most likely going to run, which to me that was like, so does this mean you didn't think you had competition before with you know, Connie Pillich and Nan Whaley and you know, Betty Sutton obviously joined with them, but Bill O'Neill, it made it, I'm reading into that that he sees yeah. Kucinich as his first real It's opponent. a bit of a subtweet. Exactly. Yeah. That's, well, what, that's what the character is. Joe Schiavone yeah. was, Joe is still in the way. But I think there was a, a thought there for a while that when, you know, back when you think about like September, when we were talking about the four who'd been in the race, these people who had been working for months, and then all of a sudden we were talking about Richard Cordray and Jerry Springer. And oh that was going to be the big competition. <laughs> All right, and then Jerry that Springer. That seems like years ago already. No, doesn't it? And then Jerry Str Springer took himself out of it, and it almost seemed, to, I think, to some Democrats, like Richard Cordray is going to be the guy. You know, the, the other candidates they've done a good job, but if Cordray comes in, then he's going to be the guy. Well, now all of a sudden you have Dennis Kucinich expressing an interest, which he was all of last year, but he just wasn't talking about it. He was doing public events, he was going out to community meetings, he was talking about charter schools, doing all these things, and he actually endorsed uh, the drug price issue, issue two. Uh, but every time we would ask him, are you running for governor? I'm not here to talk about that, which a lot of us read as, oh, you are. You're just not ready to talk about that. <laughs> or, uh, or he's here to not talk about right? that. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> he's here to, to be out there. And, and so I think, I, I think the people who didn't take him seriously did so at their peril. And, and also um, Bill O'Neill, he had been talking for a solid year. He's the Supreme Court, the only Democrat in elected statewide office. Bill O'Neill had been talking about this for a year, saying he was going to sp think about it for a whole year, and if Richard Cordray got in, he was going to get out. Well, then Cordray got in, and O'Neill said, well, Cordray's not endorsing my plan to legalize marijuana, so I'm going to stay in. 
which was interesting, and it's very, very interesting to hear a sitting Supreme Court justice talk about policy issues like marijuana and solar power and some of the other issues he's brought up. And so there was actually a move at the State House to try to remove him from the bench. He's supposed to leave January 26th, right before he's supposed to appear here at the City Club and talk on January 30th. So I don't know if that's going to happen, if, they're, if state lawmakers are actually going to try to take him out before he gets a chance to leave on his own. Well, Cinder, what do you think the Democrats are going to try to plan to do here to, to retake some of these statewide offices that they haven't held in a long time? Before I answer that real yeah. quick, I wanted to add on to the last question. I think the interesting thing about Dennis Kucinich is, you know, all along we've been talking about have, what have Republicans learned from Trump? What have we learned about campaigning as a result of President Trump's candidacy and how he ran things? And, you know, so you have different candidates who are talking about whether or not they're going to use the Trump model. And, you know, is that going to work for me? Is that what I want to do? And I think Kucinich is one of those candidates who, as a Democrat, is actually looking at the Trump model and thinking, okay, is this something that maybe I should look at employing as one of the few Democrats across the country that may be looking at, at having such a model? So um, your question again. Sorry. Well, actually, I think that I think that begins yeah. to address that question of, right. you know, how do Democrats think that they can win statewide office in a state that Trump won by eight points like, right. or in 16. I, mean, I, th I think what Karen said at the beginning, it's all going to have to be about the issues and, it, you know, if they're... If they're looking at distancing themselves from the president, it's going to have to be issues that here are hitting in Ohio. Okay, President Trump campaigned all along that he was going to bring back coal jobs. And, you know, he really got a lot of that labor support that maybe some of the other Republican presidential candidates would not have been able to get. Well, Betty Sutton is a labor darling, so, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that they'll bring up some of those issues and his lack of movement on, on them. Mm -hmm. Henry? It's kind of a tough position if you're David Pepper, the chair of the Ohio Democratic Party. He, you know, he inherited a, a fractious party after the 2014 uh, gubernatorial election. And one of the things that he made a point of going into this cycle was, you know, the party was going to stop putting such a heavy thumb on the scale during primaries. We saw during the Senate race in 2016 with Ted Strickland, there were some people that were unhappy that the, you know, P.G. Sittenfeld may, maybe not was maybe wasn't given a chance to shine as much as a young Democratic office holder should. The field was mostly clear for Ted Strickland, and it was not a very good result for Democrats at all. And so Pepper has heard from members of the, of the party about this, and so he's kind of kept a hands-off approach, which means we haven't seen a lot of the horse trading that typically goes on. Uh, and it's not going on on the Republican side really either, but we did see Cordray and Sutton team up. We did see DeWine and Houston team up. But what we haven't seen are some of these other Democrats. Democrats have some interesting candidates running for governor, but they all want to run for governor. They all wanted to run for governor. <laughs> you know, Joe Schiavone couldn't be talked into running for attorney general or for, for auditor. Uh, Connie Pillich, who ran for treasurer last time, apparently couldn't be talked in to running for anything lower. Or nobody was having those conversations because David Pepper and some of the other party leaders don't want to look like they're forcing people out. And now you're at this point where Nan Whaley is dropping out. Is she going to run for something down ticket? I think she'd be a strong candidate for Democrats if she did. Um, you have one woman left running for governor on the Democratic side. You, David Pepper can't talk Connie Pillich out of the race now. How's that, how's that going to look? I mean, it's, and Connie Pillich is a, is a talented candidate, too. You know, she was the bright spot on the Democratic ticket in 2014. So right. they are, they do kind of have this top-heavy bench, and they're, you know, I think down ticket, they're going to have some, some problems because of it. The, the, well, Karen, this whole yeah. idea of, of David Pepper not wanting to, to do this, exactly that issue of 2016 when the Democratic Party endorsed Ted Strickland, one of the loudest voices against that was Bill O'Neill. He went on Facebook where he confesses a lot of things and uh, <laughs> said that he thought that the Democratic Party was, was crazy, that they were, uh, they were expecting the same result that they had gotten in the past and the inmates were running the asylum or whatever he had said. And he turned out to be absolutely right. And so the idea of him being talked out of the governor's race at this point seems very unlikely because I think he may be there almost to prove a point, almost to say, I, I think the party needs to have new leadership. He's got a really strong name that he runs under, O'Neill. And uh, he unseated a sitting Republican Supreme Court justice when he ran uh, with almost no money. So he, he's not somebody to completely disregard, though his statements and his ideas are a little bit, well, they're interesting. Let's just put it that way. I want to turn our attention to the Senate race here. And um, Cinder, when you look at uh, Sherrod Brown's reelection bid, and he'll either face probably Jim Renacci or uh, Mike Gibbons, um, 
I've got to imagine that that campaign is going to attract a lot of the attention and the money. Uh, do you think it's going to be hard for these down-ballot candidates to get attention and money, given that there's this huge high-profile Senate race kind of over their heads? I, I do. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of money, again, in Ohio. It's not, I, the Ohio Senate seat right now is still not listed as toss-up, um, according to most of the folks that are out there, most of the talking heads. It's not, it's not in any of those columns. But, I mean, I have to believe that because of the president's polling in Ohio currently and how strong he still is here, that the Democrats are going to put a significant amount of money to make sure that Sherrod Brown is safe, that he is reelected. Um, but, but you also don't know what those conversations were with Jim Renacci, how much was promised to him to run, how much, you know, how much then, you know, are Republicans going to be pouring in here? Are the Democrats going to have to up their ante too, even though, like, like I said, I expect them to spend a great deal anyways. Um, and then the gubernatorial candidates, I mean, they, are they going to, depending on who wins, it's, it's like, you know, does the Democrat run with Sherrod Brown? Like, are they a strong, unified team or are they running on separate issues? The same with the Republican, you know, depending on which Republican wins. If Mary Taylor wins, it's probably easy for her to stand up and have a unified ticket with Jim Renacci because they were talking about similar things in the gubernatorial primary. What about Mike DeWine? You know, is that a different, I, I think it's very, it'll, it'll be very interesting to see who comes out of these primaries and how they're running. The, the Senate race already stacks up, in my opinion, to be, I mean, 2012 was the most expensive Senate race in Ohio history. This one's probably going to be more expensive. I mean, just look at the primary when you've got Mike Gibbons saying he'll spend $5 million of his own money. Jim Renacci is the 41st richest member of Congress coming into this race. That's just the primary. Sherrod Brown has $10 million in the bank right now. So this is potentially a very expensive Senate race coming up. And that's not even counting super PACs or dark oh, money exactly. or all the other yep. uh, you know, surreptitious ways that money is spent in an election. Henry, uh, do you think that Sherrod Brown is going to have a tough challenge here from, from the Republican? I, I think actually it might be a little bit tougher for him now than it was when Josh Mandel was the likely nominee a week ago. I mean, this broke about a week ago right now that Josh Mandel was, was dropping out of the race. You know. It would have been a rematch of 2012. Uh, Brown's campaign team is uh, his campaign manager, was his campaign communications director during that 2012 race. They have studied Josh Mandel. They have a thick book on Josh Mandel. They know exactly what type of campaign to run against Josh Mandel, and now they don't get to run that campaign. And I've been talking with some of my Democratic sources in Ohio over the last week. They're, they're, I think some of it's lowering expectations, and I think some of it is genuine. This isn't going to be as easy as we thought it was. Now, that said, uh, before Mandel dropped out, I hadn't talked to one national Republican who thought the Ohio Senate race was a marquee race going into 2018. There are some other states where they, the Republicans really have to defend their turf, like Nevada. There are other states like Missouri where they have a really good shot at picking up a seat that's been held by a Democrat. And also, it's a credit to Sherrod Brown, who a lot of Republicans think is close to unbeatable. He is a known quantity here. He also has some of that populist appeal that helped Donald Trump, you know, and possibly more authentic than Donald Trump's uh, brand of populism because it's been a part of Sherrod Brown's political identity for so long. People know that about him. So it might get a little easier for the Republicans if they do get Jim Renacci as their nominee or if they do draft a J.D. Vance into the race and he ends up becoming the nominee because you have somebody who's a little bit more of a a blank slate than Josh Mandel, who might energize or excite the Republican base more than Josh Mandel would, and, and again, somebody that Sherrod Brown hasn't run against before. So, do you think? How do you think he's going to have to uh, campaign in relation to Donald Trump? I mean, do you think Sherrod Brown is going to have to really attack Trump in his campaign, or, or maybe he should try to go easy on him given the popularity the president has here? I think he's done it already. I mean, after the election in 2016, I think it was like the Maybe the Monday after, you know, Sherrod Brown did a news conference where he, like, you know, he put the onus on Trump and said, I'm willing to renegotiate NAFTA and look at some of these trade deals. Where are you? Send me your plan. Let's work together on that. And so I think you'll see more of that, like on issues where they do have some common ground on this populist economic uh, agenda. Sherrod will emphasize that. I think on the areas where, you know, where it comes to some of this rhetoric, like what we saw last night uh, about, uh, 
uh, some of these other countries and Trump speaking disparagingly of them. I'm not allowed to say the word, sorry. Um, but you all know, you all know what I'm talking about. Um, I think then you'll hear Sherrod Brown criticize that sort of rhetoric as being beneath the presidency and the national discourse. Sandra? I agree. You agree? Karen? Oh, yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, Sherrod Brown uh, made a point of this week that uh, Trump was signing a bill that he had been involved in on fentanyl. And th there's another issue that a lot of Republicans and Democrats can get together on in terms of trying to stop this terribly dangerous drug from getting into this country. So, yeah, I, I think Sherrod Brown does speak to a little bit of that. But clearly, when it comes to these sorts of issues like the disparagement of, of people in other countries, the, the potential that that can do in terms of damage to relationships with allies and that sort of thing, I mean, Sherrod Brown's going to... He's got a lot to talk about in that area, I think, uh, in terms of how he views it versus how the president views it. So we're going to turn over to questions in just a couple minutes here. So if you've got things you want to bring to the panel, start thinking about them. And uh, shortly we'll have people with microphones. Uh, before we do that, though, I want to ask each of you, is there an issue or a storyline in this election in Ohio that you think has not gotten a lot of attention because the oxygen has just been sucked out of the room by so many other uh, newsworthy events? Putting your thinking faces on. You mean the, the, this upcoming election? Yeah, this election. Do you think there's something that's just not getting a lot of attention that we should be paying attention to? Yeah, I hear Jerry. Well, and, th and that's going to come because we've got two potential ballot issues here. You've got the one that the uh, state lawmakers are working on right now that could come onto the May ballot, and uh, we're still waiting to see exactly what that looks like and whether it will even make it. It's got to be done by February to get to the May ballot. So that could come up, and if that then does come up on the May ballot and it passes, that could affect the citizens' groups that are trying to put their own issues that they've been working on for a year and a half onto the November ballot to try to change the way that the congressional map is drawn. So I think that's, that's going to be a big deciding, uh, driving issue, I think, going forward. Mm -hmm. Sandra, any other issues? I mean, I think more than an issue, and we've already talked about it, is the governor himself. I mean, he's trying to get some of the air that's left, what's little of it, and he's not getting it here. I mean, he is getting some of it nationally. He's on some of the national you know, shows. He seems stuff, like a regular on the Sunday shows. Right, right, right yeah. I think, in, I think infrastructure is an issue that always gets sidelined. And in the past, it wasn't getting any oxygen at all. But with Trump, it seemed like it was an issue that was going to take off. And we have this joke, every week seems to be infrastructure week at the White House. And it ends up getting sidetracked by the, you know, the glib comment of the day. But I think in Ohio, it's a very important issue how, you know, roads and bridges and, and, and sewage lines, all that stuff is maintained. And all that stuff equals jobs as well. And it's something that when you message it right, works pretty well. And, you know, we're just not talking, it's, it's, it's just not talking about wonky issues like that. Mm -hmm. Well, today we are enjoying a Friday forum on the year ahead in politics featuring Henry Gomez, political reporter at BuzzFeed, Sindra Miller-Cole, instructor of applied politics at the University of Akron, and Karen Kastler, State House News Bureau Chief at Ohio Public Radio and Television. Our moderator is me, a uh, reporter and producer here at IdeaStream. Now, we're about to begin the audience Q&A, so we welcome questions from everyone, whether that's City Club members, guests, students, those of you joining us via our radio broadcast, webcast, or Facebook Live video. If you'd like to tweet us a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and uh, the staff here will try to work it into the program. So uh, if you've got questions, you can approach the folks at the microphone here or raise their hand and they'll, and they'll come around to you. Do we have a, a first question here? Good yeah. afternoon. Thank you so much for coming together so quickly. This has been very interesting. Um, when Cordray announced he was running for governor, Brent Larkin of the Plain Dealer wrote a column saying that in order to be successful, the Democratic candidate for governor is going to have to raise at least 20 million dollars so my question to anyone on the panel is do you agree with that assessment and if so where does that Democrat get all that money Sandra you're the you're the campaign finance expert here so I mean I definitely think that the number is high I don't know that it's as high as 20 million dollars but just looking at the money that will be poured into Ohio from everything from the campaigns themselves to the political parties to the PACs and super PACs yeah I mean to get any sort of of, of airtime, what, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is that you're spending that money on, it's definitely going to be a lot. Where they get it, I, I mean, uh, everywhere. I, it, it, is, it, will be, it will be everything from the small grassroots events, making sure that you know, people 
get to know them at the same time as giving a little bit of money to those high dollar events both across Ohio and DC and everywhere else that there is to give money. You think they'll have to go out of state to get money I too? do, okay. yeah. Oh, I think there's no question. And if, if either Cordray wins or Kucinich wins, they will have a national base that they can turn to because obviously Cordray is, is known for being the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Kucinich, like we've talked about, has been known. So I, I think that there's an opportunity to go outside. But absolutely they're going to have to. I mean, when you think about the money that, that Mike DeWine and John Houston had coming into the primary, uh, Mary Taylor was way, way far behind, but whoever wins that race, it, they're going to get a lot of money too. So yeah, I, I think $20 million, it sounds like a figure that, that would make sense in Henry, this environment. Henry, do you think the, the candidates are nervous about fundraising or their people are nervous about, can we actually raise enough money to do this? I think they should be. I don't know that 20, I mean, I don't, 20 million is, it sounds like the right, the right amount. But, I mean, atmospherically, a lot can happen in Ohio. If Trump's popularity does go down and that becomes more of a, of a referendum type issue on Trump, then I think that really, really helps the Democratic nominee. Um, I do think Mike DeWine is a uh, known quantity. He's established. He's got a lot of money with Houston. I think it'd be probably easier for the Democrats if they didn't have somebody who also has spent a long time in public service running against him, because then you could play that angle a little bit more. But um, you know, outside money, that'll, uh, you'll need it. And I don't know how much Ohio will command because it depends on whether it's seen as like nationally a marquee gubernatorial race. And if DeWine is perceived as a heavy front runner, then that might not help. The Democrats raise money, but Rich, Rich Cordray, if he's a nominee, he's gonna get money from like the Elizabeth Warren network of progressive, uh, progressive donors. And I think that'll be helpful to him. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a next question here. <clears throat> I thank you for your comments. Um, I appreciate your comments, but it seemed to me there were very, very little comments about issues. It seems today that we're living in the era of the cult of personality. Sindra, you said something about Kucinich doing the Trump model. I'd like to hear more from you about what is the Trump model? Is it just you know bombastic rhetoric and false promises? Um, I mean, what what is it that, I mean, what, I'd like to know that. And then the alternative, what about the issues? What are the real issues that we're going to hear about and not just personality in this in these elections? We can start with the Trump model sure. question, then we'll move on. I mean, I see the Trump model as, as a couple of different things. I mean, yeah, it's definitely a, a lot of talk, but it is some of that, like, populist, I mean, Henry Lee to that a little bit but you know just this whole I'm going to talk about issues I'm going to talk about things that make people uncomfortable I want people to say like you know what that that's somebody that's honest he's not one of these insiders that's stuck on what pollsters say and what the talking heads say but he's somebody that's really going to go out there and do something for me um, average candidate or you know average citizen that lives in Ohio so I mean I think that that, that definitely plays into it but then also this whole notion of, I mean, when Trump was running, I don't know if you remember, but when he would talk about money, it was, I'm not raising money to, to run for president. I'm, you know, I, that's not how I'm going to do things. Never mind the fact that there were PACs everywhere just pouring money into a Trump candidacy. I mean, super PACs, dark money, whatever, whatever it is that you want to call it, there was plenty of money to be had, but he wasn't the one spending it. So then he didn't have to be as accountable as what, you know, some people where the money's coming from the campaigns. And, and also just, I mean, Oh, I, Henry, I, I, well, I want to go ahead, Henry. And then we'll... it, it is. It is. It's become personality-driven, right. and it's become even more so because of how how Trump won. And yes, you could blame the media for a lot of that, but I think I think that policy reporters do push candidates on policy. The candidates don't do a great job talking about it. Um, I think if you have seen on the Republican side, Mary Taylor's talked a lot about. Medicaid expansion to try to differentiate herself from Kasich, but that also has a personality implication because she's trying to position herself and brand herself as not John Kasich and as somebody that's more in line with base Republicans on health care and on Medicaid expansion. You've seen Mike DeWine talk a lot about opioids. Opioids, and I'm not trying to speak like, you know, I'm not trying to be cute or glib here. I mean, but that's become like the issue in right. politics over the last few years. And I think it's become something that's really easy for politicians to talk about because it's an issue that we all understand and all have a lot of a great deal of empathy for. But there isn't any substance behind what they're talking about when they're talking about these things. It's they, you know, politician A looks good and caring because he's addressing he or she is addressing the opioid crisis. Rob Portman used it to great effect in his re-election campaign. No one knew what Rob Portman really was about 
before his reelection campaign. He'd served one term. It was kind of like with Sherrod Brown. You knew you knew he was you know you knew he was about fair trade. You knew that he had this populist uh, image to him. But you didn't really know what Rob Portman stood for. But then Rob Portman made his whole reelection campaign about opioids, and that's what Rob Portman stood for. And I think it helped him. But it also built his personality up too. So I don't. I don't know that we, you know, maybe we don't ask enough questions about infrastructure, which was the issue I mentioned. Um, and when we do, we don't get great answers, so the story just sort of fizzles out and doesn't become more of a, it doesn't register as more of a, a talking point or extended story. Also, the news changes so fast now. I mean, it's, you know, something that happened, we, we keep joking about it, things that happened last week feel like they happened, you know, before Christmas, so. And another thing, when it comes to the issues, it seems as though, you know, the Republicans are promising this, and when they're in charge, we go this way. And then the Democrats are promising all the way over here. So I think people are getting really frustrated of watching this game of, okay, things get done, promises were made, those promises were fulfilled, and then the next party comes along and completely dismantles what was done before. So no longer are... Are we the voters even? I mean, we're allowing that to happen. We're saying, you know what, sure. We're <laughs> Obamacare, yes, we want it. The Affordable Care Act, yes, yes, yes. And then you vote somebody into office who's no, no, no. And now the Democrats are saying, well, wait, yes, yes, yes. And I mean, I just feel like that's where the average voters are just getting lost in this whole, yeah. well, what is right? Because yeah. if they take it to the extreme and then undo it to the extreme, I don't know what's right. I don't know where we should be on the well, issue. Well, let me, I want to follow up actually on another part of the question question about um, false promises, because we saw it during Trump's campaign in Ohio and all across the country, he would say things like, we're going to build a wall and Mexico is going to pay for it and it's going to be a big wall. Uh, the you know, steel mills are going to reopen. The steel mills are going to reopen. The coal mines will reopen. We'll have this resurgence of these jobs that have been uh, disappearing for a long time. Do you think that voters are going to get impatient when those promises do not come true? Well, right. I mean, they saw the, the tax package. They were happy with that. That was something that he was delivering on. He's, quote, unquote, trying with the wall, except those Democrats in Washington, they're just not helping. I mean, I feel like if you look at the people who, and, and I, I mean, this, this isn't just specific to Trump, but right now, because he is president, you look at the people that voted for him, they're happy that he's fulfilling a promise here and there, and that he is, sh he's trying to show that he's working to fulfill more promises. I mean, if you'd ask the president, he's done everything that he can on the wall. He's just waiting for, for everybody else to deliver. He's done his part on some of the promises that he made, but he is being, you know, those dirty politicians in D.C., that swamp isn't getting drained fast enough, so he can only work so quickly. Well, and I think that gets to this question that, that you often see asked in, like, people who are watching national politics who will go and do the story about, well, how do Trump supporters feel about this latest thing that just happened in the news? Uh, this question of could Democrats ever do something to change the mind of people who voted for Trump to get them to vote for a Democrat? Uh, you seem to be suggesting that for people who are forum, their forum mm -hmm. and what they see uh, confirms that belief. Right. Uh, do you think people's minds could be changed and that Democrats could make an argument to say, hey, he promised this, but it's not quite there. Or he didn't deliver. And I think there's a group. I, I think there, there there's a group of Republicans who. They didn't vote for Trump, but they wanted to. They want to see him succeed now. That they 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 <coughs> think that what he's doing maybe on the business side is what they want to see. But it's the stuff that's happening, like the comment yesterday, and and some of these other things that are really really troublesome. And and I think there's a group of of moderate people out there that that really do fall into that category. That they they want to see they 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 want to see less regulation. They want to see you know more opportunities in business. They like the tax reform package, that sort of thing. But they're appalled and horrified by the comments and the behavior and the 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 exaggerations and the the, the promises and the things like this. Mm -hmm. Those are the voters that can and would decide an election. I mean, we've we've become so tribal now, and I say, like, I use the royal we as our country, so that, you know, a reporter like me can point out to you or to my readers or to a person I'm interviewing over and over again, well, Trump didn't, said he was going to do this and didn't do that, and he said he was going to do this and he didn't do that, and you can point out all these facts, but the, the trust in media has disintegrated and everybody just retreats to their own corners that it doesn't matter if I point that out to my readers. They, if they like Trump, they're going to still like Trump. And it doesn't matter that he's that Mexico's not paying for the wall. And it doesn't. And I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's it's a frustration I have as a journalist that you can point out all this stuff, and it's like, well, the media said it, so it must not be true, or the media is just, or the whole, the whole uh, take Trump, take take Trump seriously, not literally. Like you know, he's the president of the United States. He. 
and he said he was going to do these things. And if you're not going to judge him on that, then that's fine. But like, don't blame me for for not writing enough about the fact that he's you know not doing this or not doing that or that he said he'd do this and he ended up doing that. Like it just there's it's it's maddening sometimes. You end up in this well, loop. And I think that creates a real problem for all of the Republicans that are running for office because you like like Karen pointed out. I mean, there is that group of people who. They don't like the man, but they like the policies. And you know, how closely do you align yourself with the man, the office, the policy? Like, where is that line drawn to be successful and and to be able to communicate your message in a way that works? And I think Karen. we've seen some pieces of, uh, where national reporters have gone to Trump country and talked to reporters or talked to voters about Trump. Why did you support Trump? Why? why what was it, what was it about him that swayed you? And and that's been very interesting. It's been interesting to see national reporters come away from, you know, Washington, D.C. And, and come to Youngstown and, and come to some areas to try to talk to real people, which, you know, arguably we should be doing all the time. But I think there's also the other argument of, of I think we, we also need to talk to reporter or uh, voters who didn't turn out. Why, why haven't you been coming out to vote? What is, what is keeping you from coming out? I mean, the, the, the numbers that turned out for Obama is the numbers who turned out for Clinton. Why were those numbers down? And, you know, just as we look at the effect Trump had on those voters, the effect that Clinton had on Democratic voters, I think that's there's a, a really great story there, too. We've got a question uh, in the audience here. Yes. Oh, over here first. Then we'll, then we'll come to you. Don't worry. The Mandel to Renacci switch, was there a deeper calculus there? And I just asked because I didn't hear anything at all about what the real issue was with Mandel's wife. I don't mean to pry into his personal matters, but I'm surprised there was no follow-up, or maybe I just missed it. I think it's really touchy for reporters to ask because his wife is, she's, she's a spouse, a partner, a family member, a child. These are people that are inadvertently involved in politics, and I think we're very sensitive to try to ask questions of those folks because they're dragged into this that maybe they didn't ask for it. Uh, but certainly, you know, his wife's illness aside, that is the reason that he said he was leaving the race. There are some questions, there were some questions about Mandel in terms of being able to produce a different result than he did in 2012. I think there were a lot of Republicans who were very concerned about how he performed against Sherrod Brown. I mean, you folks are City Club members. I, I moderated that debate between Sherrod Brown and Josh Mandel in 2012, and it was unbelievable and so and that was the first of three unbelievable debates so I think there was a real concern that Mandel was was just not going to, to be able to deliver that seat uh, and that maybe somebody else would so I mean I think that's a separate issue to his wife's illness we don't I don't think that it's comfortable I, I'm not comfortable asking about that but it's it's I, I noted it out there, he, he is staying in his job as treasurer, but said that the campaign for Senate is too much for, for him to be doing right now. I mean, they have three, I mean, they have three young children, and so it's, I think it's, you know, you want to take statements like that at face value, and I haven't, I haven't heard anything to believe otherwise on his reasons for pulling out of the race, but like, you know, whatever it is, I mean, they've, they've, they're a young couple with a young family to raise, so like, I think that's uh, obviously, you know, it, it's weird to us because we're all, you know, those of us in the media are cynical and we, and, and even those of us who follow politics tend to be. So it's, you do, you know, it's natural to have the question about is there something deeper? But I, I think in this case, it's, it is, it is what it is. And uh, all the stuff Karen mentioned, you know, about like the challenge Mendel's going to face, are, are, it's absolutely correct. I mean, but uh, he, Josh is also a young guy. I mean, he's still in his 30s. Uh, this might not have been the best. Uh, uh, political atmosphere for him uh, to run, um, and now he's not, and he might still have a future down the line if he chooses to. So he's doing what he feels is feels he and his family need to do right now, which that's that's my take on it anyway. And it, it does his decision, the timing of it does though, kind of lock him out from anything else. I mean, he will once his term is up at the end of this year, he will no longer be in office. So I I, I don't know what I mean. It was a very sudden decision, so you. Have have to assume that there was a very, very serious reason behind it. So that's worth mentioning, I think. Mm -hmm. Got another question? Uh, I got two questions. The first one is, how does tax reform play out on this? I mean, who does that help uh, in, in the gubernatorial race? Does, does it, what, how does that play out? How do, they, how do you, how do the Dems play it? How do the Republicans play it? And who does that ultimately help? And the second question is, uh, 
I mean, is Ohio going to elect its first Hispanic uh, congressman in Renacci's seat and its potential successor, uh, Anthony Gonzalez? It's, it's looking pretty good for Gonzalez right now, isn't it? He's got, I think he's raised the most money of any Republican candidate that I, that I uh, last time I checked anyway, and I'm not sure that what, uh, what Democrats are planning for that. Well, he's got to get through too. a primary, too, though, with yeah. Christina Hagan, who, I mean, I, I think Gonzalez has got structurally a lot of advantages in that primary because he's got Washington support, he's got donor support, um, but Christina Hagan has aligned herself very, very closely with the Trump wing of the party. She has a good a good ballot name. I mean, we, we talk a lot about ballot names. Hagan is not a bad ballot name to have. And it's, it's uh, so I, I'm, I'm interested. I mean, I, I think, yeah, on paper, Gonzalez is favored to win the primary, but he's got to get through that first. And, uh, but interesting, interesting candidate. Um, he was, his, they were, his background Washington, with Ohio State football doesn't hurt, right? Right. <laughs> Washington Republicans were very excited that he, that they got him into that race. Um, and then you saw Tom Patton kind of get out not long after it became clear that Gonzalez was going to uh, suck up a lot of that money. So, And on the question of the Republican tax bill, um, do you see that being something that statewide candidates talk about at all on the campaign trail? I think it's it's part of the whole economic issue. I mean, I th th that's one of the issues that, that kind of gets pushed to the side a little bit in favor of, of some other things. I mean, Democrats are going to talk about taxes. They're going to talk about especially state taxes and, and how things have been going over the last couple of years. I mean, the unemployment rate is not dramatically, it, it's been up and down, but in this area there that's still higher than the national rate, and yet the tax cuts that happened at the state level were supposed to, to do something about that, so Democrats are going to talk about that. Republicans are going to talk about this national tax reform and, and how they feel that tax cuts have sparked Ohio's economy so and, and, and brought it back from the recession. What I think this is very interesting, and I talked to Budget Director Tim Keene about this uh, this week, this whole idea of a year ago, Governor Kasich was talking about we could be on the verge of a recession. And a year ago, we were facing this potential budget crisis where we ended the year, they had to cut $800 million out of the budget because there was this huge hole that was opening up. So the idea of a recession is not that far away. We're in a period where we've had long sustained economic growth and, and what are we going to do the next time we have a, a contraction in the economy? So did you want to add something to that? Or? I mean, I, I think one way that voters often vote, and I mean, this is talked about a lot, is, you know, are you better off now than you were two years ago, four years ago? You know, and I believe that Jim Renacci will really look at the benefits, the potential benefits of the tax plan and use that to his advantage when people are answering that question. So I, I think that he will definitely latch on to and try to talk about that and take ownership of it as he's running. And Henry, I'd imagine that you'd hear Sherrod Brown talking about the corporate tax cut side of this, saying, look, this is a giveaway to big business. Yeah, it'll be a huge issue in the federal races for Senate and for these uh, House races in Ohio. Where, yeah, and Sherrod, that's that's some, that's an issue that'll be in his wheelhouse, but Renacy's also going to emphasize, he's going to try to play up, you know, do you have a little more money in your paycheck every week? You know, um, this is just a sign of good things to come for Republicans, but Sherrod's going to emphasize the giveaways to the um, yeah, to the, to the corporate community, which is actually a talking point that would be at home in Steve Bannon's wing of the Republican Party, um, which is just one of the many ways that there's so many contradictions there. <laughs> Correct Karen. me if I'm wrong, but didn't Renacy miss a vote on the tax reform package because he was campaigning? I don't know that for sure. Oh. We'll have to we'll have to check that it, out. It, we'll we'll it, give you the answer online. Okay, there you go. After I, I thought I remember reading um, that. We've got another question here. Yes, Matt Zone. So. When you think of voting blocks, there's no bigger voting block than the women vote. And you look at both sides in this election with now DeWine and um, Houston teaming up and you have Mary Taylor sitting there and on the Democratic side, you have Shavoni, Kucinich is probably gonna jump in the race. Nan Whaley's out now as a candidate. Uh, Betty Sutton has chosen to be uh, a Lieutenant Governor candidate and Rich Cordray. Um, what does it look like? And I'd be curious to hear Cinder and Karen's response. And Henry, you could feel free to add at the end. Um, the, the women block, the women vote. And I will tell you, as somebody who has five sisters, uh, my sisters are pretty upset that women are taking a back seat to, to men in this election. Well, I think it's telling that all of the gubernatorial tickets right now have a woman on them except for one. So, I mean, to put it bluntly, I think that the candidates themselves definitely see a value to the women in the women's block. Um, 
I also find it interesting, I was talking to some of my um, Democrat colleagues and friends, and they were a bit ticked that Betty Sutton was Cordray's running mate in the role that she is. They were hoping that it would be the other way, that you know that Sutton would be at the top of the ticket or Nan Whaley would be at the top of the ticket and that Cordray would be coming back to Ohio to help the woman rather than the woman you know, taking him and, and carrying him that way. So, and the other thing, right before we came up here, I was reading um, Martha McSally just declared for Senate down in Arizona, and her comment as she was de declaring her race was that the Republican Party needs to grow a pair of ovaries. So, um, <laughs> so, so I think I think the women are trying. And to that's going to be an interesting race to watch. Just, I mean, Joe Arpaio is in that race. The the son, uh, the sheriff. It, so. Yeah. That race is going to be very interesting to watch, absolutely. But I, I remember asking a couple of political strategists um, on our TV show last week, what are the chances? We had all these women. We had four women who were running for governor and two women who had been named a week ago as running mates. What were the chances that we'd end up with two tickets who were all male? Well, we have one ticket that's all male. Um, Connie Pillich is now the only woman on the Democratic side who's at the top of the ticket and is still in the race. And um, I've been told she feels like she's in a good position because she's the only woman at the top of a Democratic ticket right now. Uh, it'll be interesting to see who she selects as a running mate. If she selects a woman, that could be extremely interesting. But um, I, I think the, the women's vote is going to be critical. I mean, when you think about the, the women's marches that were happening a year ago and, and the, the mobilization that started there, the question is, did that momentum continue? Is that momentum still in effect today to try to bring people who are very concerned about these issues? Obviously, the, the whole Me Too movement does galvanize a lot of women to say, hey, we, we want a bigger role in state legislatures and, and in, in governorships and that sort of thing. But you know that's where it has to start, too. It has to start at the local level. It has to start at the state level. These federal candidates, they don't get there, except for Donald Trump, by accident in the sense that they work their way up typically. And so the, there's, a, there's been a need for more women at the local and state level for a long time. We have another question uh, here. Yes. Okay. Uh, I do not see much focus uh, and interest in the uh, immigration, about the immigration issues, especially in light of TPS, uh, DACA, refugee issues, even today, if I may say. I don't see uh, more coverage or focus on, the, on these really important issues. Another part of that is also international issues that are really affecting our local politics, our local even you know, uh, outcomes here, uh, like North Korea, the Middle East, that again, uh, you know, impact us greatly here. So where do you see that going to be played in the media or even more coverage of that and more focus to bring more attention to this? Yeah, the question of immigration, I mean, you've, you've had the Immigration and Customs Enforcement say that although border apprehensions are down, arrests uh, within the interior of the United States are up. Uh, the acting director of ICE saying that no one is exempt from deportation. They're trying to signal that now that Trump is president, there's going to be a change in outlook on immigration. Henry, do you see that becoming an issue in Ohio? I don't know about it in Ohio. I think, it's, I think it's covered very extensively at the national level. I mean, it's, it's one of those issues that... I think we're seeing a lot of the anecdotal stories. Uh, the Plain Dealer has had some has some had some pretty good coverage of individual examples of like a family in Lorain County or the business owner in Youngstown who's going to uh, who faces deportation despite you know being a very you know productive and positive contributor to his community. Um, but I, I think it's and I think as far as world affairs go, I think that uh, I think that might play more into Ohio just because I think when you've got the president tweeting threats to North Korea, that becomes something that alarms everybody or concerns everybody, not just, you know, a national electorate, but, you know, you know, uh, John and Jane Doe in Ohio, so. Thank you for not saying Bob and Betty Buckeye. I Bob almost did, and that's why I came up with I think, you know, for a while we've had a governor who's been very willing to weigh in on those issues, on all these national issues. I mean, almost every time Trump has said something about a particular issue, you've seen John Kasich tweet out some sort of a response. So there, there's been some attention here. I think there's going to be a, a lot more attention on these issues in the Senate race than the governor's race, though. But certainly what the president is saying about those issues is going to come into the discussion in the governor's race as you've got these uh, two tickets that will try, be trying to decide 
how far or how closely for the Republican side, how far away for the Democratic side, they, they want to be removed from the president's opinions as expressed in social media, especially. Senator, anything to add to that? Thank you for the question. Uh, do we have another question here? Yeah, we're actually going to take a, a question oh. from Twitter at this point. Okay. Um, one of the panelists mentioned no, no, no versus yes, yes, yes. It seems there are more instances of moderate politicians retiring or leaving office. Does the panel believe compromise on public policy outcomes will become even more difficult? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sad to say. It's hard. I mean, look at all the, I mean, look at Pat Tiberi, who's, who's, you know, ran for the exits, and look at, um, you know, look at Jeff Flake, who, like, six years ago, seven years ago, was one of the most conservative members of the Senate. I mean, he was a uh, rock-ribbed, you know, Chamber of Commerce, uh, libertarian wing Republican, and now he's too moderate for the current Republican Party, and he was going to lose his primary in Arizona. That's the McSally uh, race that Sindra just mentioned. He was going to lose that primary. I mean, he was polling extremely low, and he's he's had enough. So yeah, it doesn't. It's, there's nothing about the current culture or atmosphere that incentivizes somebody like Jeff Flake, who, despite being solidly conservative, is willing to compromise on immigration reform, for example. And I, I think you know, gerrymandering plays a huge role in that. Uh, the fact that the person who wins the primary typically is the one who wins the general election anymore. I mean, when you've got people winning primaries by double di or uh, winning general elections by double digits because the districts are drawn in such a way that it guarantees one party versus the other will win. And right now, the balance in Ohio is 12 to 4. And under the next uh, redistricting proposal, we're potentially going to lose a congressional seat. Who knows what that's going to look like in the future? I think that really contributes to more of that because typically the parties go to the extremes for the primaries, and then if there's no reason to come back toward the center, there's no reason. I'm, I'm looking to my folks in the back here. Do we have time for another question? We've got a couple minutes left. So one more question here, uh, sir. You can yeah. close us out. Okay. Uh, um, I wanted to know what does the panel think about where the millennials stand on, you know, the future for Ohio and who do they support? There was a Quinnipiac poll out in the last couple of days that said they really don't like Trump, really. Um, the thing is, they, they really don't vote that much, I don't think. <laughs> that, that's, and and that, that's an issue. I mean, again, we can talk all we want about campaign strategies and who's saying this and who's saying that. In the end, it matters whose voters come out, what voters do when they actually are in, you know, when they're sending in their absentee ballot or when they're actually casting their ballot, their polling place. That's, that's what matters. It was interesting for me. Um, when I was a student at the University of Akron, I was, uh, I was in the minority as a Republican. There were not, I mean, most of my classmates and professors, I mean, I felt like I was surrounded by folks who didn't think like I did. Well, now as a professor, it's interesting to me. I feel like in the last two or three years, there's been a bit of a switch, and my classes are made up of a majority of Republicans. Mm. And I, I find that very interesting. Now, you know, I teach political science classes, so I find that even more interesting. I mean, I think each of my last two semesters, I have had um, a significant favoring of the Republicans among the millennials in my classrooms. Yeah, I, that's, that's interesting to me. I, I do think that if millennials do get out and vote, I think that they are a threat to the current um, political setup as it is with Republicans when it comes to, we see more tolerant attitudes, you know, more accepting attitudes towards things like gay marriage. I mean, that helped turn the tide on an issue such as marriage equality. And I think that the more these millennials age into the voting population actually start participating more. I do think that probably is bad for Republicans. Um, we all thought that we'd see more of that in the last presidential election. We didn't. And so long term with the Republican messaging and plan is, is probably not sustainable. Uh, but who knows? I mean, that's an interesting it, it, piece of uh, evidence yeah. there, Sandra. Well, thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you to our, our audience and all of our questions. Today at the City Club, we're enjoying a Friday forum on the year ahead in politics. Our community partners for today's forum are the Cuyahoga Democratic Women's Caucus and the League of Women Voters. We welcome students from Flow Homeschool Co-op. Student participation in City Club forums is provided by many foundations, including the William M. Weiss Foundation, and we thank all of you for being here today. That brings us to the end of our forum, so thank you to Henry, Sindra, and Karen. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.
For information on upcoming yeah, speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.